Hello everyone, how are you going? Welcome to the Origins of the Nanaimo Bar, something that I've sadly never had but I've definitely been recommended and so I'm keen to find out some more information about this supposedly tasty treat. The survival of the Nanaimo Bar is unusual and I like to say that it's the Kardashian of the Canadian dessert world because it's famous for being famous. <laughs> I guess that lines up with what I know. The Nanaimo Bar is definitely a Canadian tradition. It's one of the very few Canadian recipes. Uh, there's only three that are really well known. Poutine, Nanaimo bars, and the butter tart. The Nanaimo bar is recognized as one of Canada's uh, most popular recipes, and it's actually sold in Canadian-themed restaurants around the world, uh, including London, New York, and even Taiwan. Ooh, okay then. Well, in that case, I definitely have to keep an eye out for it. I don't believe I've ever seen it in any store because Australia has its fair share of tasty or at least sugary treats as it is, even though I know that Canada has a lot of sugary treats. But what confused me the most is, yeah, when they showed these ones, why are they so yellow? I didn't believe it was so yellow. Everywhere else, it's kind of that creamy, beigey color, but that's like, maybe it's got lime in it or something? I really don't know. I mean, I guess it's just going to be a different recipe and like I said, maybe have some lemons and limes and things in it, or maybe it's just a different cooking process. Actually, no, it's a no-bake bar, isn't it? So, yeah, it must be just a different recipe. But is it flavoured? That's what I'm wondering. So an Nanaimo bar is a no-bake refrigerator cake. And the Nanaimo bar itself is made of a base cake, which is graham crumbs and cocoa for the main part, and butter. And then it's frosted with a custard-flavoured frosting, and that's really a critical element. And then the top layer is chocolate, which kind of holds the thing, whole thing together. The concrete that holds the entire thing together. And it certainly makes sense because you needed to, because the other two things in the bar look kind of like a caramel slice, probably even more important than a caramel slice because it's less sticky, I can only assume. But because you're using a custard, there's going to be very little structural integrity in there. And then once that base starts to crack apart, it is just going to break into a million bits. To be fair, you can see them all there, even just the coconut. But then I was wondering, what is that and why does it look so green? Because if I was to just guess what this is, I would think that would just be eggs. But then looking at this, I just don't really know what it would be because I don't want my eggs to be green like that. There is a sense of mystery on the origin of the Nanaimo bar, but that isn't really unusual at all. If you take the hamburger, for example, which is America's iconic food, we don't know who made the first hamburger, and we don't really know what country it's from. So this is pretty typical of just about every food. Usually origins are not really clear. So when we went to look for the origin of the bar, we started with the Vancouver Sun, and it turned out that in 1948, there was a recipe printed for the bottom layer. What we next know is that in 1952, the auxiliary to the Nanaimo Hospital brought out a cookbook. And in it, there's one that's pretty much the modern oh, equivalent. That's right, because from memory, there were a few different places that this thing was popping up, but it did start out as a chocolate square. And what does it have in it so I can know? I mean, straight off the bat, I have no idea what a double boiler is, but apparently I have to melt a quarter cup of butter, then add a quarter cup of sugar, five tablespoons of cocoa, okay, and then one egg. So there is egg in it, but where is that limey looking color coming from, I'm wondering? Oh, but hang on a second. I've just realized that it says cook for three minutes. And I guess even though she said this isn't the perfect recipe of what they use today, I just had in my head that they use no heat to make the entire thing, you know? I mean, I knew that it was a no-bake bar, but I was just then expanding that into no saucepans or anything like that, but then it does start off by melting a cup of butter, and you definitely want to be doing that. And so unless Canada is just dreaming up some crazy invention to get around that little fact, I can certainly agree that you're going to want some heat, but the no-bake is where it's really interesting how it just combines like that. We know a little more about the name. We can be absolutely sure the name was invented by the Vancouver Sun. And it's named by Edith Adams, who was an imaginary person like Betty Crocker. A whole bunch of writers acted as Edith Adams. And uh, that's where the name first appears, is in the Vancouver Sun. Oh, I thought... Wow, okay, then I thought it was something completely different. I thought it was two brothers stole it from somewhere and then they took the name and named it because that was a town they were living in. That was the last story I heard and that's my memory of it. But hey, I guess I can take two things on board. I mean, it's certainly looking very similar to the other recipe that we just saw, even though this one also does have vanilla in it and then two cups graham cracker crumbs. What is that? Something single? Okay, then one cup coconut. So it really is expanding it where before I guess we just saw the custard or I don't really know. Either way, just reading that list, I can certainly understand how all those ingredients combined to be one tasty bar even just the base for goodness sake like they said the graham crackers which is like a random cracker in australia and then the coconut and then the chopped walnuts wow the nanaimo bar is really a product of its age it's populox is what we call it it's a very 1950s modern invention and what you're really seeing there is a break from formal sit-down dinners to a lifestyle where newly wealthy middle-class blue-collar workers would have cocktail parties 
and they wanted finger food that you could carry around and eat while you talked. And then Animal Bar is a great example of that. What we really saw then was a move away from homemade, and that was that was very calculated. Companies pushed the newly stressed housewife to move away from making things from scratch and adopt right. newly made industrial products that were seen as better. And so you get really strange things like uh, Jello and Campbell's soup uh, that are incorporated into almost any kind of recipe. <laughs> So if you look at the Nanaimo bar, it's basically butter and sugar with five commercial ingredients added. The coconut, right. the cocoa, the chocolate, the graham crackers, and the bird's custard powder. That is the sort of thing that was being served at these church luncheons, at these cocktail parties. Wow, 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 wow. Alrighty then. There is certainly a decent amount to unpack there and even just history behind the entire thing. So I'm glad that they're going into it and not just going, oh yeah, it came from this spot and then just that's kind of it. That's all we know about it. They seriously have done their research because I guess it's a Canadian favorite, but it really caught me off guard that it absolutely just was a product of its time. You know, you have all of these products like they're showing here, all of a sudden just coming off the market. I guess after the war, because you said the 50s and really just having an explosion of brands that are world renowned, you know, Lipton, Heinz, Jello, Campbell Soup. Like the list goes on it's insane and so for her to say it's just a couple of ingredients which makes sense but then just to list off all of these and finish off with a bird's custard powder i can only assume that is kind of the original but i have no idea what that is custard powder i guess that really is the 50s isn't it susan mendelson is probably the first person to sell it commercially and she actually put herself through college selling the nymo bars and she sold them in her popular cafe and catering company i had written a number of cookbooks and then one day the phone rang and he, this guy said well I um, have the rights to all the souvenirs at the Expo 86 that's going to be here in a year and a half and I'm wondering if you'd be interested in doing a cookbook, a souvenir oh. cookbook for us. As if you would say no to that, that is an insane thing. I mean I guess no one really knew how big it was going to be but Expo 86 and she was just front and centre on this magazine or cookbook or whatever you want to call it, that's insane. Especially as you already have a whole bunch of cookbooks and so it's going to be the perfect thing just to launch your entire plan platform especially if you're just going to be selling Nanaimo bars and so yeah she must be minted just from selling Nanaimo bars. And then one day the phone rang and he, this guy said well I um, have the rights to all the souvenirs at the Expo 86 that's going to be here in a year and a half and I'm wondering if you'd be interested in doing a cookbook, a souvenir cookbook for us. And the Nanaimo bar was featured in the Expo cookbook of course so the Lazy Gourmet in 1986 had three locations. We sold a lot of Nanaimo bars during Expo 86. <laughs> Expo 86 introduced the Nanaimo bar to the world. Overall the food at Expo 86 wasn't very popular. There was actually a lot of complaint about overpriced hot dogs and McDonald's sort of dominating fare. But the cookbook was popular, and that definitely did spread its appeal. Yeah, right. Look at Expo that. Expo 86 changed British Columbia forever. And part of that is because they made a conscious effort to extend the fare to the whole province to a degree. Towns were encouraged to take part. And in Nanaimo, Expo 86, they really, they had the bathtub race, and they had the Nanaimo bar. And so they sort of ran with that. And for a while, they actually had a mascot named Nanaimo Barney, who was totally terrifying. And he has fortunately been retired. But they did Aww. also have a recipe contest. And uh, Joyce Hardcastle's recipe won as best Nanaimo bar. And it's still on their website. I mean, look, it makes perfect sense, especially with something on this scale. But it is always funny just what someone's claim to fame truly is. And if you're just the winning Nanaimo bar of Expo 86, or just in general, well, you're certainly going to be doing all right. But it's crazy to see this footage of Expo 86 because I've seen and heard so much about it before but I've never actually seen it in action you know I know from Heritage Minutes and everything kind of the wild stats that I had just the millions and billions of people that attended it and I mean even though she commented on the poor food management of the entire expo you know just feeding people rubbish day in day out at the same time to be having such an explosion of popularity just drilling into people's minds going this is an Nanaimo bar eat it you will like it and take it back home and then buy it there as well because as it says here 22 million visits of which that was 7 million people so you're having 7 million people most likely consuming your food and then winning awards for it and then just taking that knowledge back home. And so I don't know how many of these guys that had just roaming the streets of Expo 86 but I feel as though no matter how many they had it just was not enough. I thought it was great fun. I was, oh, I was totally unprepared to win. It never occurred to me that I was going to win so I was quite surprised but ever since then it's just been fun. It's just been nothing but fun. Well when you don't know that you're a piece of Canadian history it's like a surprise to hear it. Now I can say I'm, I'm very proud. I'm very very proud. And, and it's, I'm just proud for this city though because the city has embraced the Nanaimo bar and a lot of people are promoting it and uh, and brought it to you know to the forefront where it's a very popular thing now and well known and I'm glad for that. And so she should be you know because even though I was talking about before how it's insane how people have different claims to fame honestly this one is a very nice one it's not really doing an 
any harm to anyone in the general sense of the word. Maybe if you have a few too many of her incredible recipe ones then you're just going to get hooked and addicted and you're going to grow a little bit larger. But to be included as part of Canada's history to that degree, you know, having such a long heritage of the entire thing and that being your claim to fame and even just then towns kind of accepting it and going, cool, this is what we're going to take on board. The town and Imo itself not shaming her out going, how could you make us popular for this random thing that we don't like for some reason? No, 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 we want to enjoy our bathtub racing and that is it, nothing else. No, there isn't even some rivalry or competition about how it should be and what's the best way to do it or even some dark cloud that hangs over the entire history of it, you know, maybe someone just invented it in the beginning but then someone else just stole it and mass marketed it to everyone. No, there's none of that. The entire thing just seems like it's a very, very, very sweet ordeal or I guess, to be honest, just sweet in general. Moving forward, as Nanaimo continued to evolve as a bit of retirement community, they decided to get in on the place branding trend. In some places that means wine or cheese, but in Nanaimo, men Nanaimo bars. So the Nanaimo Trail has been around since about 2011, since an idea. Wow. Uh, it started with about 14 participants on a one-page little brochure and it has grown from there. I came up with the idea because I thought it would be a fun and kind of unique activity for Nanaimo visitors to experience when they came to the city. So some of the highlights that you might come across include things like a Nanaimo bar cheesecake, a gluten-free version, truffles, uh, martinis, cupcakes, cocktails, even spring rolls and pedicures. <laughs> Wait, hang on a second. An Nanaimo, well, I guess also pedicure, but an Nanaimo spring roll. I am very, very curious as to how that would work, but honestly, curious in a good way in terms of I would definitely try it. I think in the last few years, the Nanaimo bar has been more popular as a Canadian treat. Yeah. And I think that is growing, which is interesting because sometimes foods fade away, but the Nanaimo bar is enjoying a bit of a moment. Yeah. The thing to remember about the Nanaimo bar is it's not just a snack, it's a little piece of history. Also, they're pretty tasty, so they're probably going to be around for a while yet. <laughs> and there you go. Perfect. Look at that. Like I said before, they are perfect little rectangles with an incredibly thin layer of chocolate. I mean, to be able to cut through that and not have it break on you. I can only assume you're going to be using a hot knife or something like that, especially given the fact that it is all a no bake, you know, you don't have any kind of setting process, like I said, concrete setting in the oven. But hey, what can I say besides it was certainly nice just to listen and learn about the literal little slice of Canadian history, you know, just going back in time before it was even a Nanaimo bar in the first place. And so I guess now that I've learned about the masterminds behind it all and even just this massive rise to fame, especially through Expo 86, there is really only one thing left to do and sadly I can't exactly do that today. I don't have it in a Nanaimo bar but I would love to try one at some point and truly just see once and for all how this Canadian hero stacks up against the rest of the world. You know, you've got caramel slice to commit to, you've got vanilla slice, custard slice, plenty of slices, but I'm sure it would not disappoint. But anyway, in saying that, I reckon I'm going to call it there. So thank you for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, feel free to do the YouTube algorithmic things down below. Also, if this is the first video of mine that you are watching, then make sure to go check out any other ones I've done. Also, make sure to go check out the original video down in the description below. Or hey, maybe even just want to consider subscribing so that you don't miss another one of these in the future. But all in all, have a good one and see ya.